it's a really interesting uh, moment in our uh, in EAL development because, uh, as you know, for the best part of what is now certainly in certainly in my living memory, there's not been uh, any kind of uh, serious attempt at uh, looking at EAL in relation to assessment. So this is really the first time in 30 years and we're happy to be uh, involved. Let me introduce my colleagues. Uh, I'm Constant Lowe, uh, I work here at King's College. Uh, Michael, Michael's from Cambridge. Neil, also Cambridge, uh, uh, English language assessment. Yung Ken, also Cambridge. Okay, let me quickly describe what we're doing, okay? Our brief is to develop two sets of rating scales, one for primary, one for secondary. The time scale for the development is 18 months. And we are seven months into that project time, okay? And so in the round, we are hoping to be able to present to colleagues um, our, our work next September, about at the beginning of the academic year, okay? The scales, if you like, the work we do, the, the, the documents that we will be producing and the materials uh, for, uh, for use in school by teachers, uh, will be entirely free, uh, so there will be no charge, because we are funded by a charity. And we ourselves, we are a charity. So, uh, so there's no, uh, no money involved. And uh, so, Cody asked me uh, over coffee, you know, since you guys are doing some work, should we stop looking at other systems, you know, between now and then? Well, my feeling is don't stop doing anything. Um, firstly, because we might produce a whole bunch of rubbish. That's the first thing. <laughs> Let's just suppose that's not true. It would still be good if you, if you have lots of experience of doing assessment anyway and you can then evaluate what we do and then pick and choose and get the best thing for yourself, for the children and the school. So really that there's um, no recommendation that you should do anything at all. If anything, do more of it so that you can better use whatever it is that we might be able to produce. So this is the sort of pre, uh, basic preamble. Our brief is really to provide, if you like, uh, a school and teacher friendly uh, set of um, assessment material so that they can better serve the learning of EAL children in school. Okay? And then, you know, we are not interested in just doing um, a set of rating scales that would provide summative scores, but we're aiming at <coughs> providing material that could be helpful for formative purposes, in other words, uh, assessment for learning, uh, some folks would prefer that term, okay? And, um, and we will also provide some guidance material for the teachers as part of the rating uh, framework. And there will be, we'll be making an effort to work with expert teachers uh, to exemplify our descriptors, our rating scales, so that there's a kind of practical <coughs> set of examples so you can see how the rating uh, can be done in relation to curriculum subject classroom activities okay so we're trying to be as uh, user friendly as possible this first workshop uh, will address some of the fundamental principles and explain some of the concepts that we are using we are doing research into what would constitute reasonably sound uh, assessment uh, uh, rating scales. So we're not making it up as it were uh, as we go along. We're actually doing quite a lot of uh, research, looking at what's been done elsewhere by colleagues here and, and overseas, as well as drawing on teachers' uh, uh, experience. So, just some first principles. So, EAO development, first thing to say is not the same as mother tongue development, both in terms of uh, chronological start, age of entry into school, but above all, one of the key differences, as we all know, is that many EAL uh, background pupils have other language or languages already, and so their bilingualism or, or multilingualism or their multiliteracy, if you like, uh, would bear on what we do. 
And as you know, we need to take into account uh, different schooling experiences, possibly even life experiences, you know, family and community uh, circumstances. You know, increasingly we, we're looking at different and diverse groups of EAL pupils. They are not all the same. This is not the 1970s or 80s when we have, if you like, uh, predictable groups, if you like, identifiable groups of uh, new Commonwealth citizens. We're not talking about that anymore. We're talking about European uh, uh, fellow citizens. We're talking about uh, possible, uh, in the near future, new arrivals from uh, areas of the world where, you know, where there's war and other difficulties. So we are bearing all those issues in mind and we are trying to capture, if you like, what EAL pupils can do at any one time and at the same time provide some sort of framework for the teachers to see where they are going in relation to EAL development. Okay? So what are the purposes? The purposes are many. Uh, first thing to say is, of course, uh, any assessment system would have to handle new arrivals. Um, so at the moment, schools on the whole are highly aware of this, but on their, at the same time, they're not terribly well equipped to do this because uh, you know, the lack of staff, the lack of uh, background experience, and very often, you know, pupils arrive at different points of the year, making it very difficult to make the right kind of provision and so on. So we're trying to develop as part of the assessment framework uh, some kind of profiling system for schools to use. So it's not just a test, if you like. It would have, it will have other things. Okay. Uh, the, the framework we're developing, uh, we hope, will be very useful uh, to help teachers to make judgments in terms of what they should uh, be expecting at a particular age with certain kind of backgrounds and so on, so they can identify what <coughs> pupils uh, have achieved already, but at the same time also helping them to identify what they might achieve with support. So in other words, there's a developmental trajectory for EAL, okay? And of course, with that, we can say, teachers can say, well, we started here because when we arrive in January, we identify this profile, so we need to know by June where you should be, and many talks in terms of, for example, uh, need to know how you get people up from, for example, from uh, emerging to consolidating. And that's the kind of thing that we like to build into it. And indeed, many said, uh, you know, we threw down a challenge for us to say, you know, make this visible in the rating scale, okay? And of course, um, increasingly with um, um, the kind of management that we have in school now, um, using data to determine school policy and allocation of resources uh, uh, is a very big area. And so the information that we hope to enable teachers to generate both in terms of a possibly a summative a test score of some point, at some point of the pupils' learning as well as the formative information uh, might help uh, school managers, head teachers and so on uh, to work out how best to um, distribute the, the resources they have. Um, and ultimately, what we want to do is to provide a set of rating scales to promote learning. Um, and that's probably our ultimate aim. Okay. Um, when we're thinking about you know, starting, we are at our initial stage uh, now. But you know, one of the key aspects, I suppose, a key concept that's underlying, that underlies all assessment of learning, including uh, learning of EAL uh, students, is the concept of progression. Um, so whether we're talking about standards, levels, phases, stages, whatever language which, which uh, is being used is currently uh, flavor of the month, uh, the concept of progression is fundamental to learning and also, of course, to language learning. And so we do need a global scale against which to um, uh, measure uh, progression uh, and, and, and to link it to the unique individual profiles of, um, uh, of, of an EL learner. So that, that sort of common language issue that, that, that you were raising there. So we need to have some, some common descriptors that will serve that purpose. Um, this uh, enables a common understanding on pra 
practitioners, policy makers, um, teachers within, within schools and between schools, um, and is valuable for teaching and administrative purposes. So it's not just this sort of local uh, and, and focused progression in particular aspects of language. We need some kind of more global uh, description, which takes into account all the different factors that, um, so, uh, some of which uh, Constant mentioned there, that feed into the, the, the growth and development of an EAL learner once they arrive in this country. Um, so our framework must also measure and evaluate a range of aspects of language proficiency and um, relevant to the needs of EAL pupils rather than to apply onto them uh, descriptors that were really originally uh, developed with a different kind of learner in mind. Uh, the framework should illustrate pupil achievement through performance exemplars uh, that characterize levels in, in particular knowledge and skills. So we need exemplars to, to, to help uh, the teachers give some kind of uh, uh, indication of, um, of, of the profiles that, that the learners are working towards. Regarding measurement and evaluation, the complementary roles of classroom assessment and psychometric tests should be considered. Uh, a lot of uh, schools I know use uh, the cognitive ability tests, measuring verbal and non-verbal skills, thinking skills, and, and so on. And at the same time, you know, what is the link between that and formative assessment, classroom assessment uh, on language and also subject matter. So the, the notion of construct, what it is that we are uh, seeking to, uh, to assess, is key to the construction of a framework. I'm the assessment person in the team, if there is one assessment person, and, and we think in terms of constructs, uh, and I'll sort of explain and illustrate what we mean by that. Uh, we're talking about models of progression in a particular skill or domain. I'd like to give you an example of uh, a construct as, as it appears in, in a particular text. I'm thinking of a, a, a cognitive, cognitive processing core, which sort of starts at the bottom, you can see, with seeing words. This is a model for reading, uh, with looking, word, looking at words, recognising words, lexical access, moving upwards into higher and higher levels of, of, um, of understanding. That core calls on a range of different kinds of knowledge, knowledge of lexicon and form, syntactic knowledge, and then higher up, general knowledge of the world, knowledge that allows you to, to make inferences and, and things like that. And your, the, uh, the approach of a student to, to using or exploiting this uh, is, is, is on that side there, the notion of uh, uh, a metacognitive faculty which allows you to um, decide how to tackle a particular reading problem. Is it a problem which requires you to read carefully or read globally or expeditiously or so on? That's, that's the notion of a construct. This comes from a, 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 a one book in a series of four which Cambridge English have produced on constructs for reading, writing, listening and speaking. And uh, thinking about the common European framework and thinking about what it is that you're adopting or what it is that you're referring to when you adopt the common European framework. It's, it's quite useful to think of it as, not as, a, as this, this is the book, you know, I never go anywhere without it. It's not just the book, it's, um, it's an area of ongoing work. And for example, this is what in, uh, Cambridge English has, has contributed to the, uh, to the development of the, the common European framework. Uh, that sort of cognitive or socio-cognitive dimension, which was missing in the original text. And that was commented on, and, and as an assessment body, we have found it very useful to, to, um, to, to construct that set of things. You can imagine that if you are asking item writers to write sets of items for a particular level, then they have quite a, 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 um, a specific model here to work with. This, this illustrates my four worlds of, um, of language use. Uh, at the bottom we have 
assessment and we think in terms of constructs, as I said, uh, explicit descriptions of proficiency. But the same ideas are used in different ways. The, in the social world, people think in terms of skills, things which are useful to society and which are rewarded. They're rewarded by being able to establish friendships or they're rewarded by getting a better job and so on. In education, one thinks in terms of subjects which are defined in terms of curriculum or syllabus content. Uh, and the personal world, that's the world of the individual, where what we are interested in is that development of that learner's cognition. So really, we think the assessment function is the one which holds all of this together, because it's the constructs which really give meaning to the notion of uh, what it is to learn a language. And, and it reflects the fact that languages have value in society, it reflects the fact that uh, cognition develops in a particular way, and also it's, it should um, impact on the way that language teaching or language, the goals of language teaching are, are uh, shaped within the, the educational sector. Performance <laughs> is, is, is a key notion in all of this. That, uh, the, those four worlds that I showed you, they, the, what links them together in terms of observations that you can make which allow you to talk about ability and, and, and difficulty and things like that. And it's the task. It's the task that holds everything together. Um, if I ask you to, to, to just look at that cycle there, which begins with performance, which is observed, which leads to evaluation, which leads to feedback, which leads to further performance, I could ask you, is that a testing cycle or is that a, a learning cycle? I would, I would say, I would say that it's that there is no difference. Yeah. I would say that the, you know, the, the basic thing about learning by experience. You know, you go out, you do something, something happens, you think about that, and next time you do better. That's learning, and, and that's the that's the essence of that cycle. Whether it's done in a formal assessment way or in a classroom way, it's always the same thing. So the assessment cycle is identical to the learning cycle and the formative summative distinction, which we all made for some time, has been called into question to the extent that it tends to represent formal assessment and a classroom assessment as being sort of diametrically opposed to each other. You know, and you know, formative assessment is the thing which saves education, but we still have to do lip service to, to, to formal to formal assessment and so on. That's not a useful way of thinking. We need a kind of systemic view of how everything should fit together. Okay, so we have a task here. How can assessment tasks generate useful insights into EAL learners' progression in English? Going back to the bigger story of uh, thinking about a, a set of uh, references for our own thinking. And I think like many colleagues in this room, uh, we ourselves also feel that the CEFR, the Common European Framework for Languages, uh, uh, is indeed a uh, very useful uh, backdrop uh, for our work. Uh, it has many, many uh, rating scales. For those who are familiar in that blue book, uh, and it's free download if, uh, if you're interested, if you haven't seen it, just go on the website and you get a whole lot. And, uh, and, and there's quite a lot of discussion uh, on the website and elsewhere surrounding uh, the learning of languages and so on. So from that point of view, you know, we very much look to the CEFR as a reference point. Okay? And we're particularly interested in the way that the descriptors, the can-do statement, you know, can engage in a conversation, can write, can. so it's a very positive action-oriented kind of approach. And we, we like that rather than judging people negatively. Cannot do, for example, is quite a difficult concept. Okay? So, and also, in pragmatic terms, it has wide currency in the world. Um, 
This morning there was a map of uh, Pisa. It went everywhere in the whole world. If we were to show you the same map, the world, with CEFR covering it, then you would see that about half the world is covered by CEFR, not just in the heartland of Europe. It's gone way beyond that. So, for example, the whole of New Zealand uh, language learning curriculum, national uh, language uh, curriculum, is referenced with CEFR. And all the tests that many uh, uh, this morning discussed, IELTS, TOEFL, and so on, all reference to it. So there's big name rec uh, recognition. So you know, it's not a bad thing pragmatically to use it as a reference. <coughs> However, <coughs> we don't think ourselves that we can use the CFR descriptors directly without some kind of further work. Why? I think Michael already mentioned that it was conceptualized with foreign language learning in mind. And there are lots of differences between foreign language learning and additional language within the curriculum. In that, you know, the first ob obvious uh, point of entry is, you know, foreign language curriculum, you often have the content of the language learning controlled, pre-specified. So you know what you need to do. And the activities within foreign language lessons would tend to gravitate around the um, subject and the topic content, not everything. Whereas EAL is practically the whole of the English language universe, every second in the school for, from the learner's point of view. So it's very difficult to equate the two. And so therefore there are difficulties with uh, thinking about this CFR as directly applicable in the school context uh, for additional language background pupils. The other issue, of course, is foreign language uh, curriculum tends to have some kind of carrier content in terms of, you know, uh, stories, transactional context, such as buying things, selling things. You know, those of you who've been doing EFL at any time, any level, would know what I'm talking about. All those books you can buy always have some kind of content other than language because they are the background <coughs> story to carry the language teaching learning activities. Okay? That's one kind of content. But for EAL, the content is completely different because it's not generated by EFL textbook writers to carry the grammar content or vocabulary content. So nations first thousand words can be embedded in an EFL textbook by <coughs> inventing stories to carry those thousand uh, items. EAL can't do that because the content is driven by the subject areas and, and as a result you have a completely different set of requirements and expectations because the science curriculum doesn't wait for the EAL learner to develop English before they say this is year four science. Year 4 science is year 4 science. Year 4 science is mother tongue speaking science. And so therefore there's you know, a, a, a kind of clutch mechanism that we need to be thinking about. So I'm, af I'm afraid you know, we've come to uh, the view that while the CFR is a fantastic backdrop for us, it isn't directly applicable. And we're doing further work on that. And this afternoon session, for those of you who are coming, uh, we'll demonstrate how we are doing that piece of research. We are taking account of the CEFR as much as many, many other uh, uh, EAL or English language learning in North America, many different systems. So we are feeding a lot of resources into our current work. And this afternoon session would, would give you a kind of hands-on experience of what that means when you're looking at literally hundreds and thousands of different descriptors and how you choose and how you develop it, as it were, the construct, you know, for reading, for speaking, for writing, and so on. This is a slide I've used quite often talking about the, or introducing the common European framework, because um, the action-oriented model is um, ex expounded in one very dense paragraph. Uh, and the paragraph is not something I think it's worth me showing you, but this is what the paragraph is telling you as a story. Uh, what it shows you is a domain of use, a kind of a world, and a learner who comes equipped with these provisional uh, sets of cognitive, uh, cognitive apparatus, the strategies, knowledge, processes. 
the domain of use, the world, throws up tasks which have to be addressed, and that engages the language learner in language activity. And because that is essentially a, a, a reflexive process, there's self-monitoring going on here as the learner struggles to communicate, that is a learning uh, loop as well as, a, as well as a communication loop simply. And what it demonstrates is um, cognition developing within social interaction. So it's a socio-cognitive model. Uh, I'm going to focus a little bit on the theoretical background of our framework. And um, the main message so far that we want to get across is that um, it is insufficient or inadequate to assess only EAL learners' grammatical competence or uh, their knowledge uh, of linguistic knowledge, in other words. Uh, rather, we need to access and assess a range of competence which are relevant to EAL learners. So that is the main message that we try to get across so far. And you might probably want to ask why we want to do that. Why do we want to uh, access and assess a range of competences uh, for EAL learners who come to this country who do not speak English as a first language? And learning the English language is not only the learning the language, it is an intertwining process of learning the language, learning the subjects, as well as learning to be a pupil in multiple communities or practice, if you like, uh, in UK society as a community or practice, in the school uh, as a community or practice, in the subject department as a community or practice, or in the subject class, for example, a mathematician, um, a mathematician uh, classroom, and so on. So that is what we are trying to do at the moment. Uh, basically, what we are trying to argue is that we need to access and assess a range of competences which are relevant to the ER learners. And then how are we going to do that? So we think that CEFR, the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages, provides a very good framework for us to do that. Because CEFR uh, provides a framework to allow us to talk about a range of competences, uh, including the knowledge, the know what and also the skills and know how and a range of other competences, uh, competences including individual characteristics, personality traits and so on. Um, Common European Framework challenges the traditional understanding of language learning uh, which is based on the structuralist linguistics which focuses on the grammatical competence and it is based on the communicative competence which includes but is not limited to grammatical competence which also includes for example, the social linguistic competence and also the strategic competence itself. For EL learners, they need to mobilize a range of competences to allow them to learn the language in multiple communities or practice. So that is the point that we want to make so far. And what we are trying to do in this uh, project is to develop a framework which allows us to access and assess the range of competence as I mentioned earlier. We are trying to uh, develop a competence framework which goes beyond the grammatical competence framework to the community competence framework and then what we are trying to do now is the EAL competences framework. So in other words, we are going beyond we're going beyond the CEFR. We're not just doing CEFR, we draw on CEFR, but we are developing a framework which goes beyond CEFR. What makes this study different from other research is that it is empirically grounded. And what we're trying to do at the end, hopefully, is a common framework, common European framework, or common framework of reference for languages for EAL. So if we have the common European framework of reference of languages, we need a common framework of reference for languages. <laughs>